Hello everyone. Today's lecture, Basic Chemistry, covers topics of matter, atomic structure, bonding, properties of water, solutions, and acid-base chemistry. Matter is defined as anything that has mass and takes up space or has volume. Matter is going to consist of atoms of the chemical elements. The basic building blocks of all matter are atoms. Uh, some examples of different chemical elements would include carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. We see the symbols used to represent these elements in the following mnemonic, schnapps. Uh, we'll, also go, we'll also discuss the different states of matter. There's solid. Solids hold their shape and have a fixed or unchanging volume. Liquids take on the shape of the container that holds them. They have a free surface and a fixed volume. And the third state of matter is a gas. Gases take on the shape of the container that they're in. They'll also take on the volume of the container that holds them. This slide shows the periodic table of the elements. Please note the organization of the periodic table uh, places non-metallic elements in the upper right corner of the periodic table. These would include elements such as carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and sulfur. The metallic elements are located on the lower left part of the periodic table over here. That would include elements such as iron, nickel, copper, zinc, uh, silver, and gold. There's one exception to this placement rule. It is hydrogen. Hydrogen is considered to be a non-metallic element. However, in some situations, hydrogen can behave like an alkali metal. And that's why it's placed at the top of the first column on the periodic table. Let's consider using a Java applet the behavior of particles in the three states of matter. Inside of the box we see a number of small black dots. These are used to represent the particles of a solid. Please note in a solid that the particles are going to be found in a regular repeating pattern and that in relationship to the other particles, the particles are not moving. If I push run here, I can now see that the particles have begun to move. They're still closely packed together, but because they're moving, they're now representing the behavior of particles in a liquid. This Java applet is now being used to demonstrate the behavior of particles in a gas. Please note that the particles are moving much more quickly and that they're spread very far apart from each other. So we can see that they are colliding with each other. They're also colliding with the inside walls of the container that holds them. Atoms are the smallest piece of an element which is still representative of the properties of that particular element. For example, an atom of gold is the smallest piece of gold that we could ever hope to have. What are the different parts of an atom? The nucleus of an atom contains two different types of particles. Protons, which have a positive charge, and we see the plus sign on those, and neutrons, which have no charge. Again, these are the two particles found inside of the nucleus. The third type of particle found in atoms are electrons. These orbit around the nucleus in energy levels or electron clouds. Electrons have a negative charge. Let's take a closer look at an atom. We'll consider the structure of a carbon-12 atom. I'm going to build a carbon atom. So please note that carbon, based on its position on the periodic table, is right up here. I can use the periodic table to determine that to make carbon I need a total of six protons. So I'm going to go ahead and add those protons to my nucleus. And we can see that the nucleus is starting to wiggle around. And this is because the nucleus is unstable in this configuration. Now I've added enough protons. I need to also add neutrons. I need to add a total of six neutrons in order to build my carbon-12 atom. So I'm almost there. I just have three more to go. And almost there. This is Waylon. You have a call on 6-2. There we go. Waylon. Sorry about that interruption. We have one final thing to do to complete the construction this of this Waylon. atom. Sorry, you have a call on 5-6. This is Waylon. You have a call on 5-6. So what we need to do is add enough electrons so that the number of electrons will equal the number of protons in the nucleus. What we now see is that we've successfully built a carbon-12 atom. There are six protons and six neutrons in the nucleus, giving us a total mass of 12. So we have a mass number of 12 based on the number of protons and neutrons. The atomic number is found here. This tells us only the number of protons in the nucleus. 
we also can track the net charge. The net charge of the carbon 12 atom is zero because the number of protons equals the number of electrons. One final note, if I add two additional neutrons, I would make an atom of carbon 14. This is the version of carbon that's used for carbon dating. We can see that this version is unstable and this is why it would undergo the process of radioactive decay. Chemical compounds form when elements are bonded together. Some examples of chemical compounds would be H2O, hydrogen and oxygen, this is water, NaCl, sodium chloride, table salt, and CH4, that's methane. Examples of covalent bonding. Covalent bonding is when electrons are being shared between atoms. This occurs when nonmetallic atoms are bonding with other nonmetallic atoms. Methane would be an example of this, as would water. Ionic bonding involves the transfer of electrons from one atom to another atom. So now we have a metallic element bonding with a non-metallic element. Sodium chloride is an example of this with sodium being a metallic element and chlorine being a non-metallic element. This image illustrates the transfer of an electron during the formation of an ionic bond. So what we have when sodium chloride forms, we, we initially have a sodium atom and a chlorine atom. The sodium atom has one electron in its third energy level. This electron will be transferred or lost to the chlorine atom. Here we see that the sodium has lost one electron, giving it a positive one charge. The chlorine has gained one electron, filling its outer energy level. This causes the chlorine to form what we call the chloride ion because it now has a negative one charge. The sodium ion and the chloride ion are going to stick together because of their opposite charges. Opposites attract. Here we see a computer model of the water molecule and the demonstration here or the illustration is showing us uh, a space filling model of water. The red region represents the oxygen atom. The white regions represent the hydrogen atoms. Uh, it is important to note that we have um, two hydrogens and one oxygen. A different way of representing this would be called the ball and stick model. Again, I can see the red oxygen, the white hydrogens, and I also want to make note of the fact that there is an angle between the atoms. This is really important and we will typically call this the bent structure of water. Many of the properties of water are due to the fact that it does have that bent structure. For example, polarity. In this property, what's happening is that oxygen has a much stronger pull on electrons in the water molecule, much stronger than what hydrogen does. So the oxygen atom is going to pull electrons so that they spend more time on the oxygen side of the molecule. Because the electrons spend less time on the hydrogen side of the molecule, we say that that side of the molecule is partially positive. The oxygen side of the molecule, because the electrons are there more of the time, we say has a partial negative charge. Another important property of water is its density. The density of water is one gram per milliliter or one gram per mil. Please note that a milliliter is the same thing as a cubic centimeter or a cc, it's sometimes called. Objects that have a density less than one gram per milliliter will float in water. An example of this is ice. Objects that have a density which is greater than one gram per milliliter will sink. Now, a thought question. What would happen to life on Earth if ice had a density greater than what liquid water has? We'll discuss this in class. Yet another important property of water is the fact that it is a very good solvent. This is due to the fact that water is a polar molecule. We use a solubility rule in class. It is like dissolves like. Now, what does this mean for us? It means that polar substances, for example, sugar, will dissolve very well in water. It also means that ionic substances, it also means that ionic substances, for example, salt, sodium chloride, will also do a very good job of dissolving in water. Of important note here, vitamins B and C are water soluble. And this means that we need to have a very constant supply of these vitamins because they're constantly being lost by our bodies. Nonpolar compounds are not going to dissolve well in water, however, they will dissolve in nonpolar solvents. An example of this would be oil in gasoline. The following vitamins, A, D, E, and K, are nonpolar, so they would not do a good job of dissolving in water, but they are fat soluble. 
and this actually means that they can be stored for longer periods of time in our bodies. Water is considered to be an inorganic molecule. It's considered inorganic because it does not contain any carbon. Some ex other examples of inorganic compounds would include things such as NO2, nitrogen dioxide, NH3, ammonia, NaCl, this is sodium chloride or salt. Now you might look at this one on the list, carbon dioxide, and say, Mr. Pollard, this one should be considered organic. However, there are some things which contain carbon which are considered to be inorganic for historical reasons. Some other examples would include elemental carbon, diamonds, graphite are considered inorganic, and carbon oxide compounds. Carbon dioxide is considered inorganic. Carbon monoxide, CO, would also be considered inorganic. Examples of organic compounds, these are things that definitely have to have carbon. For example, C6H12O6 is glucose, that's an organic substance. CH4 is methane, another organic substance. And also the proteins, nucleic acids, and lipids and fats that are found in our bodies. They all contain carbon, so they're all considered to be organic. Solutions are mixtures that are formed when a material, which is called a solute, dissolves in another substance called a solvent. Water, remember, is typically called the universal solvent. Uh, some different examples of solutions would include a solid being dissolved in a liquid, for example, sugar dissolving in water. In this case, sugar would be considered the solute. Water would be considered the solvent. Liquids can also dissolve in other liquids. Another example, uh, an example of this would be ethanol dissolving in gasoline. In this case, the ethanol would be considered the solute. The gasoline would be considered the solvent. If we have a liquid dissolved in a liquid, how do we identify which is the solvent and which is the solute? The solute will be the liquid present in the smaller amount. The solvent is the liquid present in a larger amount. It's also possible to have gases dissolved in liquids. An example of this would be oxygen dissolved in water in a fish tank. The oxygen would be the solute. The water would be the solvent. Let's look at what happens when an ionic substance, for example, sodium chloride, dissolves in water. So at the right-hand side here, we see a salt crystal, sodium ions and chloride ions. Now, when these dissolve, they're actually being pulled apart by water molecules. So we can see a chloride ion and a sodium ion. Because of the charges, uh, please note that there's also a very specific orientation of the water molecules. Around the chloride ion, we see that it is attracting the partially positive hydrogen end of water molecules. The sodium ions, alternately, will attract the oxygen, partial negative side, of water molecules. Both ions, sodium ion and chloride ion, are be being surrounded by what we call a shell of hydration because there's a shell of water molecules surrounding those dissolved ions. This image shows what happens when a molecular compound dissolves in water. Here is a sugar crystal. We see a bunch of sugar molecules all tightly packed together in the solid state. As the sugar dissolves in water, individual molecules of sugar will be pulled away from the crystal. So here we see a sugar molecule which has become dissolved, and we see that it is also surrounded by a shell of hydration. We can see the water molecules completely surrounding the dissolved sugar molecule. This final slide discusses acids and bases. Acids and bases are substances which will dissolve in water. They are typically ionic compounds, so they are going to form ions or charged particles when they dissolve. Acids are going to form hydrogen ions, H plus ions. For example, HCl, hydrochloric acid, when it dissolves, will form hydrogen ions and chloride ions. Sulfuric acid, H2SO4, is going to form hydrogen ions and sulfate or bi sulfate ions. Bases are going to form hydroxide ions, OH minus. Sodium hydroxide, NaOH, and calcium hydroxide are two examples of bases. Water is a substance that we say is amphoteric. This means it has the ability to behave as either an acid or a base because it can produce both hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions. The pH scale is used to measure acids and bases. It ranges from 0 to 14, with 0 up to just below 7 being considered acidic, 7 is neutral, above 7 up to 14 is basic. Buffer solutions are very important in biology. These are used to uh, 
resist changes to pH, and we are, these are made using a combination of a weak acid and its conjugate base, or a weak base and its conjugate acid. And the example shows one example of a buffer of 